Hey guys, and welcome to a new series. A while back, I threw out the idea of starting this iceberg I found, called the Ultimate Historical Mysteries and Oddities, and you know I'm into history, and I assume some of you all are too. My only issue with it was that the top layer had quite a bit of mysteries we've already covered, so I asked you all what to do, and you said to just provide a quick summary of those and move on. So I figure, let's give it a shot. The iceberg covers from the Stone Age all the way up to the modern age, and the mysteries on this one have a huge variety, which I love. It covers artifacts, people, events, disasters, places, disappearances, deaths, crimes, politics, war, religion, art, literature, Hollywood, conspiracy theories, and the supernatural. Finally, I'm going to do this series a little bit different. Instead of the much compacted 4-5 to five minute mystery clips, that I usually do in the other Iceberg series, this one I want to do in a longer format, as a lot of these historical ones are served better by doing deep dives. This may lead to less mysteries covered overall for this video, but it will be better detailed. Also, it's something I just want to give a try. And judging by your responses when I ask, this is also what you wanted. So after the video is over, let me know in the comment section below if you want to see a part 2 of this series. If so, do you like the long format, or would you like me to go back to the fast food type of mysteries, where everything is compacted down to 3-5 to five minute clips? And last but not least, I say this every time, and I can't say it enough. Thank you so much to the beautiful members who have so kindly supported the channel. It means a lot to me, and keeps me going. This new series is dedicated to you. We start off with one of the more well-known ones on this upper layer, that of the Antikythera Mechanism, or what some call an ancient Greek computer. This mysterious artifact was discovered in 1901 in the Antikythera shipwreck off the coast of the Greek island of the same name, and is described as the oldest known example of an analog computer used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance. This device, which is often cited is one of the most important archaeological finds in history, was found in the remains of a wooden frame case. It had been found originally in one piece, but later separated into three main fragments, before eventually breaking down into 82 separate pieces. Four of these fragments contain gears with neat triangular teeth like the inside of a clock, the largest being about 5 inches in diameter, with a ring divided into degrees like a protractor you used in school. Pieces of wood found on the fragments suggest that it was housed in the wooden case. It looks sort of like a clock, and the case would have a large circular face with rotating hands. On the side was a knob or handle for winding the mechanism back or forward, but instead of seeing the time, you would have one hand for the sun, one for the moon, and one for each of the five known planets at that time, that of Venus, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, and Saturn. A rotating black and silver ball also showed the moon phase. It is also believed that the device had 37 mesh and bronze gears which allowed it to follow the movements of the sun and moon through to the zodiac, which allowed the predictions of eclipses. Inscriptions explained which stars rose and set on a particular date. There were also two dial systems on the back of the case, each with a pin that followed its own spiral groove, like the needle of a record player. One of these was a calendar, the other showing the timing of the lunar and solar eclipses. One inscription reveals that the mechanism once displayed a fiery red ball from Mars and a golden one for the Sun, but these have been lost to the sands of time. Speaking of missing parts, it's also believed that a portion of this mechanism that was lost contained pieces which allowed the mechanism to calculate the positions of the five known planets. It was designed and constructed by Hellenistic scientists who had gotten much of their knowledge about the stars from Middle Eastern scholars. The actual year it was created is uncertain, although it's most often speculated to have been built in 87 BC, or between 150 and 100 BC, or 205 BC. The last one makes the most sense, because recent research suggests that the initial calibration date of the device fell between 178 and 204 BC. Regardless, it had to come sometime before 70 BC, since the shipwreck occurred after that. It's really kind of difficult to put into terms 
just how far ahead of its time this machine really was. There wouldn't be another one matching its complexity until astronomical clocks came along in the 14th century. For context, that would be like a piece of technology now becoming lost and not being reproduced again until the 36th century. With so little known, there's still a ton of mystery surrounding it. Who or what group actually designed and built it? Where was the workshop located? And yeah, we know it was clearly an astronomical calculator, but for what purpose? Was it just an educational tool? An instrument to be used by astronomers? Or perhaps, just a display? And finally, the question of the advanced knowledge it would have taken to have built this mechanism has left many to wonder where the Greeks acquired the ability to make it, which of course has led to much speculation about ancient aliens. You have no doubt heard of the Ark of the Covenant, even if you're not a religious person. Hearing the words alone will probably make many of you remember the Indiana Jones movie. But what was it exactly? And what happened to it? The legendary artifact is said to be an ornate golden case built about 3,000 years ago by the Israelites to house the Ten Commandments. From the biblical description, it is fairly large, about four feet long, two feet high and wide, covered in pure gold and topped with two large golden angels called a mercy seat, and it was carried using poles inserted through rings on its sides. Inside was two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments, and according to the New Testament, it also contained Aaron's rod, which was a walking stick carried by Moses' brother Aaron, as well as containing a pot of manna, which was some kind of edible substance. The ark was created according to a pattern given to Moses by God when the Israelites were encamped at the foot of Mount Sinai, and then carried 2,600 feet in advance of the Israelites on their march through the desert. When they camped, it was stored in a sacred tent called the Tabernacle. The Ark would then go on to be linked to several miracles in the Bible. It was said to have cleared impediments and poisonous animals from the path of Israelites as they left Egypt. And when they crossed the Jordan River, the Bible says the river stopped flowing the moment the Ark bearers stepped foot in it. Many others assert that when the Israelites besieged Jericho, they carried the ark around the city for a week while sounding the seven trumpets of ram's horn, and on the seventh day, the walls fell down, allowing an easy conquest. But even this powerful weapon could not stop the evil to come, which happened in 597 and 586 BC, when the Babylonian Empire would conquer the Israelites, and the Ark of the Covenant, which was supposed to be stored in the Temple of Jerusalem, would vanish. And in the centuries since, Theologians, as well as historians alike, wonder what actually happened to it. Was it destroyed or stolen by the Babylonians? Did the Israelites just hide it and its location was lost to time? Well, if you've heard this story before, you probably know the most famous alleged location of the Ark of the Covenant. That is, in Ethiopia. To be more specific, the town of Aksum, in a cathedral called St. Mary of Zion, a story called the Kebra Nagast, which is like the national epic of Ethiopia, tells us that before the Babylonians were able to destroy Jerusalem, the Ark found its way out and down into Ethiopia, where it was hidden and remains under guard to this day. How this happened is a bit mysterious. It seems that Emperor Menelik I of Ethiopia left a forgery at the temple in Jerusalem and with divine assistance was able to smuggle it out of the country and back home with him, which sounds like a logical story, right? Well, except for whatever reason, the church authorities have one man who is now the sole guardian of the Ark, whom changes every time the guardian dies. This one guardian is the only person allowed to see the Ark, which means it's impossible for an outsider to study and verify its authenticity, assuming that it's really there. Which leads to my next point. British scholar and historian Edward Ollendorf claimed he actually got to examine the Ark in 1941 while he was there as a British Army officer. He stated it was nothing more than an empty wooden box that dated back to the medieval period. So there goes that. So if it's not Ethiopia, where to look next? Let's stay in Africa, because it's here. The Limba people of South Africa and Zimbabwe have claimed that the Ark was carried further south past Ethiopia by way of Yemen and was hid in a deep cave in the Dumga Mountains. This comes from the fact that the Limba people have their own legend that has been passed down from their ancestors 
that tells a very similar story to that of the Ark of the Covenant. In their version, an object called the Voice of God that was a similar size to the Ark of the Covenant was carried on poles by priests and was not allowed to touch the ground. This artifact was also used as a weapon of great power, able to sweep enemies to the side. Unfortunately, their legend also states that after the Ark was with the Limbo people for some time, it self-destructed. So, uh, yeah, let's move on. After this, the theories are a little less known and reported, albeit maybe a little more believable. One claim is that the Ark was actually hidden in a maze of tunnels beneath the first temple of Jerusalem before the Babylonians destroyed it in 586. However, that theory cannot be tested because that location is now the site of the Dome of the Rock Shrine, which is sacred in Islam. Another theory states that the Ark was never moved to Jerusalem until much later, probably during the reign of King Josiah between 640 and 609 BC. This is further backed up by 2 Chronicles 35.3, which tells us that King Josiah told the Levites to put the holy box in the temple that Solomon built and not to carry it from place to place on their shoulders like they used to. Of course, you also have to mention off-the-wall theories that it found its way to Rome or to some faraway place like New Guinea. Some also cite that it was taken to several different places by the Knights Templar, including that of the United States. Finally, an even crazier theory is that the Ark story was not even written until the 8th century AD when an independent writer penned a text called Ark Narrative. It's believed that story was then taken and put into the Bible much later on. And one last observation. Assuming they do find an artifact that fits the description, how does one determine it's the same one from the Bible? Can you believe in all the time we've been covering these mysteries? We haven't covered the mystery of Atlantis. And looking through my archives, the only mention I can find of it is on my pre-Columbian contact series. In that video, I did cover the theory that Atlantis was actually in South America or possibly even further north in America. But we've never actually taken a look at the other Atlantis theories, so let's get to it. But before we do, just what was Atlantis? Well, I would guess all of you know this, but just in case you have been living under a rock, Atlantis was this alleged ancient civilization that was destroyed. It was written about by the Greek philosopher Plato, and it was probably his most famous story. According to him, the founders of Atlantis were half God and half human, and they created a utopian civilization, which became a naval power that ruled the western parts of the known world. The country was made up of islands, separated by wide moats and linked by a canal that ran to the center. These islands contained gold, silver, and other precious metals, and an abundance of wildlife, while the great capital city lay on the central island. As the people of Atlantis became greedy, petty, and morally bankrupt, the gods became angry because the people had lost their way, and after an ill-fated attempt to conquer ancient Athens, a punishment by the gods was sent down one terrible night, which consisted of fire and earthquakes causing Atlantis to sink into the sea. And that story has basically led to centuries of speculation about where Atlantis was, assuming that it was real. And that is a big if. So before we actually discuss where it may have been located, let's discuss the possibility of it being real. We know that Plato said that Atlantis existed about 9,000 years before his own time, and he also claimed that the story had been passed down by priests, poets, and others. Yet, Plato's account of Atlantis is the only writing ever found that documented the place, which is kind of weird, as you would think that maybe these other writings would eventually pop up, or, at least, other people from ancient times would have cited these writings. Secondly, is the fact that Plato was a philosopher, and it's widely believed by most scholars that Atlantis is nothing more than a fictional island made up by Plato to convey his philosophical theories. Even his student, Aristotle, believed that to be the case. It's about a morally spiritual people in a highly advanced civilization that became greedy and petty, nothing more than an allegory. While others cite that Plato drew inspiration from contemporary events like the failed Athenian invasion of Sicily, or the destruction of the Greek city-state Heliki, which was destroyed by a tsunami. Even events like the Sea People's invasion or the late Bronze Age collapse might have been the inspiration. But what if Atlantis really existed? Although most scientists doubt this, it is worth noting 
The floods and volcanic explosions have happened frequently throughout history, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. We do know Plato said the island chain lay beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which we know today as the Straits of Gibraltar, and that it was larger than Libya and Asia Minor put together. Now before we discuss possible locations, let me just point out, you can pretty much pick up a world map and point to a random location, and chances are, someone has already put out a theory that Atlantis was there. I mean, that's how popular this mystery is. Tons of theories have been put out over the centuries, but we'll try to look at the most popular ones. The one location that has been suggested the most, and basically since the beginning, is that it is not out in the Atlantic Ocean at all. Instead, it is actually somewhere in the Mediterranean, laying in or near islands such as Sardinia, Crete, Sicily, Cyprus, and Malta. And then there's other theories that it wasn't islands at all. Some have speculated that Atlantis is somewhere in Turkey, or the Sinai Peninsula, or even in northwestern Africa, like Morocco. The second most postulated theory is the obvious, that it's somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, just going by the names alone gives an indication that Atlantis would set in the Atlantic. Two of the earliest islands thought to be the legendary civilization was the Canary Islands, as well as the Madeira Islands, but these are far from the only ones. Basically every island in the Atlantic has been identified as Atlantis at one time or another, most notable that of the Azores, mainly because Cores of sediment found around the Azores show that the islands were an undersea plateau for millions of years, as well as an area known for its volcanoes and many seismic events. Next, we move to Northern Europe, where the island is frequently connected to Doggerland, which was an area in the North Sea that eventually sunk into the ocean. Another theory is that Atlantis was actually based on Stone Age Ireland, and if it really existed, it would most certainly be found there. While researchers for the National Geographic in 2011 would cite a new theory that Atlantis was actually in the southern Spain wetlands and had been destroyed by a tsunami, and they stated they in fact had evidence for this. Of course, this has largely been dismissed by mainstream scientists, claiming they have a misinterpretation of results found by a previous investigation in the area. Moving on to the craziest theory, we have Antarctica. Basically, the theory revolves around the idea the many millennia ago, areas like Antarctica and Siberia were not frozen. They actually had mild climates, whereas Europe and Northwest America were covered in ice. This led to Antarctica becoming the most advanced marine civilization in the world. They had advanced to metallurgy and invented architecture, technology, art, and high-level science, while the rest of the world were thousands of years behind them in the Stone Age, and everything was all good until a comet or asteroid about six miles in diameter struck near Florida, causing a series of instantaneous global transformations. One of these was the rotation of the Earth's axis changing, suddenly shifting the poles thousands of miles away from where they had been. Of course, the biggest danger would have been the resulting tsunami that would have engulfed Atlantis slash Antarctica, and when the flooding eventually ceased back down, Atlantis would resubmerge as the newly shifted southern pole now a frozen wasteland. Luckily, some of the survivors would have left in fleets of massive ships before the tsunami hit, and they would go out into the world and help the Stone Age peoples advance. Of course, there's zero in the way of actual evidence for this one. Finally, as mentioned previously, many of the early scholars tried to link Atlantis to the New World. You can find more about that theory in the first part of my pre-Columbian contact video. There are many other theories out there, but these make up the core of the Atlantis location mystery. Benjamin Bathurst was a British diplomat in the early 19th century. He started his career at a very early age and was on a fast path up the political ladder, which might have been why, in 1809, the 25-year-old from London would be asked to go to Vienna, Austria as an envoy on behalf of the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Henry Bathurst of whom he was related to. Benjamin's mission was to assist in the reconstruction of the alliance between Austria and the UK and to try and encourage Austrian Emperor Francis I to declare war on France, which it eventually did that April. Unfortunately for the Austrians, it didn't go quite as planned and they had to sue for peace following their defeat at the Battle of Wagram just three months later. It's this background setting 
that our mystery really begins, because after Austria's defeat, an armistice would be finalized that October, and Bathurst was no longer needed in Vienna, so Lunda would recall him back home. And Bathurst, he had a reason for concern. Napoleon was extremely irritated that the UK had sent a diplomat to try and coerce Austria into declaring war, and Bathurst had long assumed that Napoleon particularly held a grudge against him, which he really just based on his own speculation and had no real evidence to support it, so maybe he was paranoid. But after the war, many people came up to Benjamin and told him of the danger that lie ahead. This only heightened his fear that Napoleon would try to arrest him on his journey back home. There are conflicting sources. Some say Bathurst hesitated for some time on how to get back safely and eventually decided to go to London via Berlin and through the north of Germany where he would then board a ship back. Other sources say that Bathurst was directed by London to take that same route. Regardless, he took the fake name of Coke and pretended to be a traveling merchant, along with his secretary who pretended to be his courier. Benjamin would also carry pistols and kept firearms in the back of the carriage, and on November 25th, 1809, around noon, he arrived in Pearlburg. He stopped for refreshments and requested fresh horses for the journey to the next station. He then had dinner at the inn. He knew that the next few hours would be the most dangerous, as French troops were not too far away. So he would ask the host where the Prussian troops were staying and who was in command of them. The host would tell him that the officer's name was Captain Klitzing and told Benjamin where he could be found. Bathurst would go across town to find this German captain and ask to speak to him. It was then he would tell him that he was a traveling merchant and he felt endangered on his way to Hamburg and requested a guard at the inn. Bathurst was noted to be extremely shaken up, unable to even hold his cup of tea still. The captain laughed at him, but lent him a couple of soldiers for protection. He would then go back to the inn and began writing and burning papers. At 7 p.m., he dismissed the lone bodyguards and requested the horses be ready by 9 p.m. as he felt it was safer to travel overnight. He then stood outside the inn, watching his suitcase be put on the carriage. Since it was November, at 7 p.m., it had already been dark for a good two hours. Across the street hung a lone oil lantern that emitted a faint bit of light, while the man looking after the horses held a lantern up at the front of the carriage, while the carriage driver adjusted the harnesses of the horse. Bathurst would walk to the front where the two men were and would be seen in the lantern light. Meanwhile, the landlord stood in the doorway with Bathurst's secretary who paid the account, and with the horses set and the driver ready, the valet stood at the carriage door with his cap in hand, ready to wish Bathurst a lucky journey back. But Bathurst never came. A little confused and a little bit annoyed, because of having to wait in the cold wind, his secretary naturally assumed that Bathurst had went back to his room at the last minute for something, so they asked the host to go get him. But strangely, Bathurst was not in the room either. With all this going on, other merchants would get out into their carriage and leave. It took a little time before everyone realized this was a serious matter, but it occurred to his secretary that maybe he had went back to Captain Klitzing to ask for guards to attend the carriage, so he would send word to the captain, who informed him they had not seen the merchant, aka Bathurst again. Klitzing actually felt a bit of remorse at laughing at Bathurst's concerns earlier, so he sent soldiers to seize the carriage, put the secretary in it with a guard, and take it further down the road where it was watched all night, while also leaving a guard at the inn. The next morning, a massive search was launched. This included the woods, marshes, and ditches, but no trace was found. Klitzing waited all noon and left to meet his commander and tell him of the events. That commander would instruct him to go to Berlin for further guidance, who strangely ordered him to go back and investigate further. Getting stranger, about three weeks later, on December 16th, two women collecting firewood found a pair of trousers turned inside out. They observed that they were stained on the outside, as if someone had been laying in them on the ground. In the pocket, was a paper with writing on it. It was a half-finished letter from Benjamin to his wife, stating that he was afraid he would never make it home, and blamed it on a man named Count Don Traigs. Also found in the trouser were two bullet holes, but strangely, there was no blood at all, and it's very doubtful that he was wearing these when shot. And that ends the story 
of Benjamin Bathurst. But the mystery remains. What actually happened? Not surprisingly, there are numerous theories. Believe it or not, one theory was that he actually made it to the North Coast and got on a ship which was then lost at sea. Another cited that his valet murdered him and escaped. But let's go back to the man actually mentioned in the letter, allegedly written by Bathurst, that of Count Dontraigues. He was actually a French spy living in London at the time, and he would actually tell Mrs. Bathurst that her husband had been carried off by military officers and killed. Even though this one sounds the most plausible, it doesn't really seem likely either. First of all, how did no one notice him being abducted from the front of the carriage? Secondly, there were no sightings reported of French troops in the area. There was also the fact that bloodhounds were employed to find Bathurst, and they never picked up a scent. Wells were checked, homes in the area were searched, gardens turned up, and not one clue. And remember those merchants that left the inn at the time all of this was going on? Yeah, they were ran down and investigated too, and nothing. Another rumor then started to circulate, and that was Bathurst had committed suicide. That rumor would take a bizarre turn when just a month and a half after his disappearance, a Hamburg newspaper would dismiss the suicide claim and state that the missing merchant, known as Coke, was not a merchant at all, but actually Sir Benjamin Bathurst, an ambassador of England, and that he had not killed himself, he was totally fine, just missing, which makes this whole scenario even weirder. Another bizarre wrinkle in this is Bathurst's missing fur coat. It was eventually traced down to a home nearby which belonged to the Schmitz. The son, named Augustus, would be questioned after a witness spotted Benjamin sneaking off down the alley toward their house, where he allegedly requested that Augustus's mother fetch him some gunpowder, which he then paid for and left. Later on, it was confirmed Augustus was not actually home that night of the disappearance, and some speculated he may have robbed and murdered Bathurst, but how did he lure him away from the front of the carriage without anyone noticing? Authorities didn't believe he could have, and assumed that he or his mother had just found the coat somewhere after his disappearance and stole it. The both of them would be imprisoned for two months for the crime of theft, but the robbery theory has grown in recent years, and most historians now believe he was simply mugged and killed. This also fits with how his pants were found with the gunshots but no blood. Whoever planted them there wanted investigators to thank Bathurst had been ambushed by several people lying in wait. In fact, Captain Klitzing would state later on that he believed Benjamin was the victim of a robbery gone bad, but there are more outlandish theories which come from the fact that his disappearance took place just a few seconds after walking to the front of the carriage. These theories cite that he fell into a portal or was taken away by paranormal forces or was abducted by aliens. There's also a more skeptical take on the actual disappearance itself. Some people now allege that the story of him walking to the front of the carriage is greatly embellished, and that he was probably nowhere near the area where they claimed he vanished from. Finally, we come to the last obvious suspect, that of Napoleon himself. In Prussia, pretty much everyone believed that Napoleon was responsible. The rumor was he had ordered the abduction of Bathurst for the sole purpose of collecting the dispatches he believed Austria was sent in England, and that his death happened accidentally during the pursuit of him, which was then covered up by the French government. Benjamin's wife would actually make the long trek to ask for a meeting with Napoleon. He would send word through his officers that he, on his word of honor, knew nothing more than what he had read in the papers, and that's probably true. Bathurst was a small fry. It wouldn't be worth Napoleon's time. Furthermore, the war had ended and there wouldn't have been any important dispatches for Austria to send to England. There was also no known personal dislike of Bathurst, because the two had never even met. The Bermuda Triangle is another one that no doubt you have heard about. Strangely, I have not covered this one either, but in case you have not heard of it, the Bermuda Triangle is a region in the North Atlantic Ocean bounded by the islands of Bermuda, Cuba, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico. Despite it being such a famous area, it's actually not an officially recognized location by anyone, and as such, does not appear on world maps. Actually, the name didn't even come into use until 1964, when a writer in a magazine 
cited that the region had destroyed hundreds of ships and planes without a trace. But even before it was officially named, writers were already speculating about this cursed area as far back as 1950, when the boundaries of the Triangle were first laid out. Around this time, people started suggesting that it could be the cause of something supernatural, and that's what makes this area a source of fascination for many. But this isn't just a recent phenomena. There are reports of unexplained occurrences going back to at least the mid-19th century, which may be due to the fact that the Bermuda Triangle is one of the most heavily traveled shipping lanes in the world. Even the air traffic in the Triangle is substantially high. In addition, the Triangle is subject to frequent tropical storms and hurricanes, which is due to the Gulf Stream that passes through the Triangle. A couple of the more famous cases that we have already covered are that of the Carol A. Deering, a schooner found without its crew, which had previously passed through the Triangle, and Flight 19 in 1945, in which a group of torpedo bombers disappeared with 14 airmen, and then the rescue crew of 13 men who went to the area to find them vanished without a trace too. However, with all that being said, there are some facts that kind of dispute the infamous legend of the Bermuda Triangle. First of all, despite its reputation, the Triangle does not have a higher rate of disappearances than any other part of the ocean. In fact, a study done in 2013 revealed that the Bermuda Triangle is not even in the top 10 when it comes to the world's most dangerous shipping lanes. Secondly, although no one has an exact count of the number of planes and ships lost in the area, the most common estimate is about 50 ships and 20 airplanes, not exactly a huge number. Skeptics as well state that a lot of the Bermuda Triangle claims are exaggerated, dubious, or just straight up unverifiable. They note that in an area frequented by tropical cyclones, the number of disappearances that did occur were not mysterious, as many of these could be attributed to storms. And some of the accounts, such as a plane disappearance in 1937, was completely made up by a newspaper writer looking to increase sales, which kind of goes to the next point. A lot of the Bermuda Triangle craziness is due to TV channels, magazines, books, etc. Knowing that the mystery of the Triangle sells pretty good. So even though they know there's nothing to it, they still push media claiming otherwise. Back in these claims, and maybe the one that really debunks it, is Lloyd's of London, the famous ship insurance company, which has determined that there has not been a large number of ships lost there. And because of this, their insurance rate for this area is not any higher than any other area. The US Coast Guard has taken it one step further and stated that it's somewhat more mysterious that there aren't more disappearances when you consider the amount of traffic. But there are still a number of people that believe it. And one of the most common theories by them is the leftover technology from Atlantis interferes with the aircraft and ships somehow. And since some believe that Atlantis is in the area, I guess that makes sense. Others believe that there is a time or space warp in the area that sucks the ships into another universe. Others cite UFOs or even more mundane theories like methane bubbles or rogue waves. Kane's Jawbone is a murder mystery puzzle published in 1934 by a man named Edward Mathers. The novel, which has a cover depicting a murdered man's legs on a library floor, is about 100 pages long and is deemed as one of the most difficult word puzzles ever created. Actually, it's been close to a century since its release and only four people have solved it. The book's pages have been organized in a haphazard way, but the book's jacket cover states that through logic and intelligent reading, you can sort them in the correct order and reveal the six murder victims and their respective killers. But considering that there are 32 million different combinations, you sort of see why very few have solved it. Making it harder is the book is filled with meandering sentences and references to lesser known novels and specific 18th century French murder trials of all things. When the puzzle was first published, it came with a cash prize to the first person who could crack it. And it's somewhat strange that in 2019, when two men found the text and decided to republish it, it would lead to the fourth person cracking it that same year. Even then, no one paid attention. It wasn't until a TikTok user in San Francisco picked up the puzzle at her local bookstore in 2021 and started posting videos about her attempts to solve it that this went viral. Her first video got almost 7 million views and puzzles sold out on Amazon within hours. 
Within a month, it had sold 325,000 copies. It also spawned several online communities dedicated to cracking it. Still to this day, only four have officially solved it. Although, I did see a Redditor who stated to have found the solution. What would you do if you were hiking and you came across a bear? That would be scary enough, right? But what if it was a cocaine-fueled bear? Director Elizabeth Banks would sort of try to answer this question in her comedic horror movie called Cocaine Bear, which came out earlier this year. Some of you may not know, however, that this film was loosely based on a real event when a man named Andrew Carter Thornton II of Kentucky would leave the U.S. Army as an expert paratrooper. When he returned, he would join the Lexington Police Department as a narcotics officer before leaving the force to, well, sell narcotics. Actually, he began piloting planes that were smuggling drugs from Columbia, and it's September 1985 that would be the backdrop of this odd story. As Thornton was flying over Georgia with a duffel bag worth $15 million in cocaine, or about $42 million in today's money, Thornton would notice that the Cessna they were flying was being weighed down by the two men plus their gear and drugs. So he would start dumping packages of cocaine off the plane over Blairsville, Georgia. When this wasn't enough, Thornton would parachute out over Knoxville, leaving his plane on autopilot to crash in North Carolina. Unfortunately for Thornton, his parachute failed and he died. Three months later, a 200-pound black bear would be found dead in the Chattahoochee National Forest that had apparently overdosed on the cocaine dropped by Thornton. The bear was surrounded by the remains of a duffel bag that investigators would link to Thornton. The bear had died of acute cocaine intoxication after ingesting about three to four grams. But this opens up the mystery. Did the bear get high? And are animals in general able to experience a high? We do know they experience some kind of effect. For example, reindeer have been observed acting erratically after consuming mushrooms, and numerous animals have been observed getting sleepy after having a sip of alcohol. And in contrast to the cocaine bear film, no one in the area reported a black bear acting erratically within the few months of Thornton dumping the cocaine off. Of course, there's always the possibility that no one was near the bear when he ingested it. One ursinologist, someone who studies bears, has speculated that the black bear most likely had a physiological reaction of some kind, but what that was is hard to say. We do have instances of animals looking for what would be considered a high though, like that of the vervet monkeys in the Caribbean that raid bars and tourist beaches looking for alcoholic drinks, and they drink until they become visibly inebriated, while we also know cats love catnip, which is the plant Nepeta cataria, and in a dose low enough to not harm the cat, but still has enough to give them a euphoric reaction, while dolphins have been observed pushing around an inflated pufferfish, which defensively secrete a neurotoxin which might have an intoxicating effect on dolphins. However, other marine biologists dispute that dolphins do this intentionally, while wallabies have been seen entering commercial poppy fields, consuming plants, and acting intoxicated. But this still doesn't answer the question, what do animals observe when high? assuming they can't experience it. Is it different than that of a human? And also, please don't try this with your pet. In the middle of July 1842, an Englishman by the name of Dr. J. Griffin, a member of the British Lyceum of Natural History, would arrive in New York. And Griffin, well, he brought something interesting with him. He had a mermaid, which he claimed he had caught near the Fiji Islands in the South Pacific. News of Griffin's arrival, along with the news of the mermaid, was quickly circulated among the press and made its way throughout the country. Reporters would even go to Griffin's hotel demanding to see it, and he would give them a small glimpse of it, fully convincing them that it was real. Not long after this, P.T. Barnum, the biggest carny in history, visited the offices of the major newspapers in New York, where he explained he had been trying to convince Griffin to display the mermaid in his museum. Unfortunately, Griffin was hesitant to do so, and Barnum, who had just happened to have prepared an advertisement in advance for an exhibition of the mermaid, which contained the woodcut of a typical European mermaid, was now useless since Griffin wouldn't make a deal with him. So Barnum would give the woodcut out 
to the newspapers who decided to print it. Barnum would also distribute 10,000 pamphlets, which he no longer needed, with depictions of the seductive mermaid around the city. This soon became a hot topic in New York, and Griffin agreed to display the mermaid for a week on Broadway. It ended up being a hit with the people, which led to it being displayed a little bit longer, and was then finally displayed at Barnum's American Museum for a month. Griffin would even be asked to give lectures to the crowd. If this story sounds a little bit too fishy, pun intended, that's because it is. First of all, Dr. J. Griffin was actually a man named Levi Lyman. Secondly, he had not randomly met P.T. Barnum. They were actually associates. There was also no such place called the British Lyceum of Natural History. And what about the beautiful mermaid? It was nothing like the beautiful bare-breasted pictures that Barnum had been passing around the city. Instead, it was like this small abomination. It would actually be revealed later that it was the top half of a juvenile monkey sewn into the bottom half of a fish. The original had scales with animal hair superimposed on its body with breasts that hung down loosely on its chest. The mouth was left wide open with teeth bared. It was posed to look like it had died in agony. Objects like these had been made in Asia, particularly in Japan and the East Indies, long before P.T. Barnum had acquired his. This one itself was thought to have been made in 1810 by someone in Japan in an alleged traditional art form amongst fishermen. It was sold to Dutch merchants, who then sold it to a sea captain named Samuel Barrett Eads in 1822. He paid a huge amount of money for the mermaid, but wasn't able to actually make much money from exhibiting it. He would leave it to his son upon his death, who sold it to a man named Moses Kimball, who then leased it to Barnum. Following the month-long display, he would go on a tour of the South, which ended up being cut short. It was then brought back to New York, where it split its time between Barnum's Museum in New York and Kimball's Museum in Boston. But in 1859, the mermaid would go on tour in London and then came back to Kimball's Boston Museum and disappeared. There's actually a couple of theories on this one. The first is that the fake mermaid simply burned up in a fire. The original thought was that the fire in Barnum's Museum in 1865 was the cause, but the records showed that it was actually in Kimball's museum at that time. So this has led to speculation that a fire that had destroyed Kimball's museum in the early 1880s was likely responsible for the disappearance of the mermaid. However, some speculate that the mermaid was not in either museum when they caught fire. It's actually thought it ended up in Harvard's Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology. That museum does possess a Fiji mermaid, but it is unknown if it is the same one that P.T. Barnum had. Apparently, Kimball's heirs donated a fake mermaid to them in 1897, and Harvard records show that the Kimballs donated it before his museum was consumed by the fire. The problem is, the one they received had a small head with no breast, different than the one Barnum's was described to be. So we're left with the mystery. Does Harvard have the original mermaid? If so, why does it not match the early descriptions? Or did the mermaid burn up in a fire or did something else happen altogether? If you have heard of the famed Spanish explorer Juan Ponce de Leon, then you may know that he is well known for leading the first official European expedition of Florida. But what he is equally as famous for is the search for the fabled fountain of youth. But did he really look for this mythical spring? And just where did this legend come from? Surprisingly, tales of the Fountain of Youth, which are said to restore the youth of anyone who drinks from it, have been around for thousands of years. Even Alexander the Great was said to have come across a river of paradise in the 4th century BC. Similar legends have been recorded in Japan, Polynesia, and England. The mythical king, Prester John, who the Middle Age Europeans believed to be a Christian king in the heart of Africa, allegedly had a fountain of youth in his kingdom. Spanish records also assert that the Taino Indians of the Caribbean also spoke of a magic fountain and rejuvenating river somewhere north of Cuba. These rumors no doubt reached Ponce de Leon in 1513, who, with his three ships, landed on the east coast of what they would call La Florida. He then journeyed down through the Florida Keys and up the west coast before heading back to Puerto Rico. Eight years later, he returned to the southwestern coast 
in an attempt to establish a colony, but was mortally wounded by an Indian arrow that had been poisoned with sap from a machinel tree. No log of either of these voyages survived, and no archaeological evidence has ever been found. However, we do know the expeditions occurred because of the letters back and forth between Ponce de Leon and King Ferdinand, as well as the letters to the new king, Charles, which are well documented. But strangely, in all of these letters, Ponce de Leon never once mentions the Fountain of Youth, nor do either king mention it. Even stranger, it was only after he died that the stories began. In 1535, Gonzalo Fernandez de Avedo stated Ponce was actually looking for the land called Bimini, where, according to natives among the islands, possessed a fountain that restored youth. However, he noted that it was just a tale and that Ponce was just looking for the land for colonization purposes, whereas Hernando de Escalante Fontaneda, who, after a shipwreck in Florida, lived many years with the Indians, would record that he had heard Ponce de Leon was looking for the River Jordan so he could bathe in it in the hopes of restoring his youth, to which they all had a good laugh over, since he lived there long enough and knew the story to be nothing more than a legend, although he did clarify later that he doubted Ponce was really in the area looking for it. But the legend continued to grow and would transform into a story that Ponce de Leon was an old decrepit man with a long white beard dreaming about his youth, which is dismissed by historians as just flat out ridiculous. However, since no documents from his expeditions are left, no one can know for sure if just maybe he was motivated to find it. In fact, three of the higher officials from the colonies sent word to the Pope that the fountain was real and that one servant had a father who had been rejuvenated by the waters. So there were some during this period that believed it to be real. But where does the original fountain story trace to? Well, we do know that Herodotus mentioned a special kind of water in the land of the Macrobians who lived at the Horn of Africa where these people went to a fountain to wash, leaving their flesh all glossy and sleek and smelling like violets. This water is said to have allowed most of them to live to the age of 120, although the legend probably goes back further than that. Regardless, by the time that the Spanish were in the New World, the legend was old and widespread in Europe. So, was it real? And if so, where is it? It's no surprise here, but as you can imagine, most scholars chalk it up to nothing more than a legend. As far as how the myth ever got started, no one knows, other than maybe a hope that it existed, or Perhaps the thrill of trying to find it. Alright guys, we're halfway through, and I thought I would put the mysteries we've already covered right here so I can give a quick summary of all of them without breaking the pace of the video. I know you already know the one about Amelia Earhart. She was the first ever female aviator to fly across the Atlantic Ocean in 1932, as well as setting many other records, and being one of the first to promote commercial air travel. However, She's most famously known for her disappearance in an attempt to circumnavigate the globe in 1937, along with her navigator, Fred Noonan. The airplane disappeared over the Central Pacific Ocean near Howland Island as the two were on the final leg of the flight. They were last physically seen on July 2nd, just one stop before that island. It's generally presumed that they died somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, but of course, that's the mystery. No one knows for sure what actually happened a massive search was launched that found very little in the way of clues and she was officially declared dead a year and a half later. And almost a century later, there is still significant interest in her disappearance. The most common theory is they crashed into the Pacific. However, some have suggested they landed on a remote island and were never found. Maybe that of uninhabited Gardner Island. Another theory was that they were captured by Japanese forces and imprisoned or killed while a more outlandish theory was that she survived the flight, moved to New Jersey under a new name. I covered this one way back in part one of the mega series when I didn't know what I was doing, if you're inclined to watch. The Babushka Lady is an unidentified woman that was present during the assassination of JFK and potentially photographed or filmed the events that occurred at the time JFK was shot. Her name comes from the headscarf she was wearing, which is similar to scarves worn by elderly Russian women. She can be seen holding a camera by witnesses and was observed standing in the grass among the onlookers and is also visible in the Sapruder film. And even after the shooting had taken place and most of the surrounding witnesses took cover, she can still be seen 
standing with the camera at her face. After the shooting, she goes to the crowd at the grassy knoll and is last seen walking down East Street. The film this woman may have taken could be huge. Unfortunately, she nor the film were ever located. This can be found on part four of the mega series. Catacombs of Paris Disappearances. I've kind of already covered this one in part 15 of the Unsolved Mega series when we took a look at the Paris Catacombs Mystery Man, which details a video that was found that allegedly came from someone exploring the catacombs who then dropped the camera and walked off into the darkness to never be seen again. And while that mystery has largely been deemed to be nothing more than a hoax, it has led to the question, has anyone actually vanished into the catacombs? And if so, how many? The answer is, no one really knows. There's so many conflicting stories of people getting lost and dying in the catacombs that it has taken on the status of an urban legend, which is no doubt due to the vastness and complexity of the catacombs. We do know at least one account though, that of a man named Philibert Aspert, who, by some sources, went down to the catacombs in 1793 to look for some alcohol and died 10 feet from the exit with a liquor bottle in his hand. His body wasn't found until 1804, and a cause of death couldn't be determined. Other than him, there's never been another confirmed disappearance in the catacombs that resulted in a death. D.B. Cooper is the name given to an unidentified man who hijacked Northwest Orient Airlines in 1971 and told the flight attendant he was armed with a bomb and demanded 200000 in ransom. He requested four parachutes and instructed the crew to go to Mexico City with a refueling stop in Reno. And 30 minutes after leaving Seattle, the hijacker opened the aircraft's door, deployed the staircase, and parachuted down. He was never identified. A decade later, a small portion of the money appeared on the banks of the Columbia River. It's the only unsolved case of air piracy in the history of commercial aviation, but the FBI speculates he most likely did not survive the jump into the heavily wooded area. This can be found in part one of the mega series. Devil's Footprints. This was a phenomenon that occurred in February 1855 in East and South Devon, England. After a heavy snowfall, trails of hoof-like marks appeared overnight in the snow covering a distance of 40 to 100 miles. They were named the Devil's Footprints because of its comparisons to a cloven hoof. This was covered in part 13 of the mega series. Henry Hudson was an English explorer best known for his mysterious disappearance on June 23, 1611 during his expedition of present-day Canada and the northeastern U.S. He was looking for a northwest passage to Asia for the Dutch East India Company. His expedition to the New World ended up being one of the most significant in terms of exploring. His final expedition, he would be the first European to see what is now Hudson Strait and the Hudson Bay. He would winter on the shore of James Bay and wanted to press on west, but his crew refused and mutinied. They cast him, his son, and six others adrift, and Hudson was never seen again. Jack the Ripper was an unidentified serial killer, active in and around the Whitechapel district of London, England in 1888. He targeted women who worked as prostitutes in the slum of the East End of London. The throats were cut out prior to abdominal mutilations. He is believed responsible for at least five murders. The name came from the hoax letter written by someone claiming to be the murderer, which was passed around by the press. Although a letter from the real killer came later on with a half-preserved human kidney, allegedly from a victim, in spite of extensive newspaper coverage and a huge investigation by police, the murders were never solved. Johnny Gosh was a 12-year-old paperboy in West Des Moines, Iowa, who vanished between 6 and 7 a.m. on September 5, 1982. His mother has went on to make extraordinary claims over the years, such as Johnny escaped and visited her one night with an unidentified man in 1997. He told her he had been abducted and now was afraid for his life and lived under a new identity, stating he could not return home. The case got new publicity in 2006 when his mom stated she had found photographs at her door depicting Johnny in captivity, but some of these photos were said to be from a case in Florida, while one boy was never identified, who Johnny's mother insists is him. In the 40 plus years, no arrests have been made. John Bonet Ramsey may be the most infamous case of the 90s. John Bonet was a child beauty queen who was murdered at the age of six in her family home in Colorado. A long handwritten ransom note was found in the home, and her father found her body seven hours after she had been reported missing. 
She had sustained a broken skull from a blow to the head and she had been strangled. Police originally believed the note was written by her mother and that her body had been staged to cover up for the murder. Both parents would be accused of hindering the prosecution of an unidentified person that committed the crime. Over the years, everyone from her father, mother, and brother have been accused, as well as an unknown intruder. All right, guys, this does it for the previously discussed mysteries. I know there was a lot, but like I said, that was the bad part of this iceberg. The upper layer just had so many common mysteries. But now that we're getting past it, if we decide to come back to this iceberg in the future, I don't think it will be as bad. Now, let's finish the rest of this video. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon are quite famous for being one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, along with it being one of the ancient world's most beautiful attractions. So it's somewhat weird that we barely know anything about it. We do know they were described as a remarkable feat of engineering with an ascending series of tiered gardens containing a wide variety of trees, shrubs, and vines, resembling a large green mountain constructed of mud bricks. It was said to have been built in the ancient city of Babylon in present-day Iraq. The name derives from the Greek word meaning overhanging, which has a broader use than the word hanging does in English. It actually refers to the trees being planted on a raised structure like a terrace. The approach to the garden sloped like a hillside and the several parts of the structure rose from one another tier on tier. Earth was then piled on these and was thickly planted with trees of every kind. The water was then raised in great abundance from the river, although no one outside could see it. As mentioned, these gardens were composed of several floors, each with a terrace of about 400 feet, and they were supported by vaults and pillars of brick. An immense staircase made of marble connected the terraces where water was brought from the river Euphrates by a system of hydraulic screws. Herodotus claimed that the outer walls were 56 miles in length and wide enough to allow two four-horse chariots to pass one another. The craziest part was the water. Babylon barely received any rain and had to be irrigated from the nearby Euphrates, which meant that the water had to be lifted into the air so that it could flow down through the terraces, watering the plants at each level. This was an immense task given the lack of modern engines and pressure pumps, which means they came up with some kind of engine that pumped water from the Euphrates. Although we know it was Babylon, its exact location is unknown. Actually, it's one of the only seven wonders where the location has not been established. One account says it was built alongside a grand palace known as the Marvel of Mankind for King Nebuchadnezzar II, who ruled between 605 and 562 BC, which was said to have been built for his wife, the queen, because she missed the green hills and valleys of her homeland. This was later confirmed by a priest in 290 BC in which he described the gardens. We also have Diodorus Siculus, an ancient Greek historian who consulted the 4th century text of Clitarchus, the historian for Alexander the Great. Diodorus says instead it belonged to a Syrian king and that the garden was in the shape of a square with each side about 400 feet long. The garden was tiered with the uppermost gallery being about 75 feet high. The walls were 22 feet thick and made of brick. The bases were deep enough to allow root growth for the largest trees, and the gardens were irrigated from the nearby Euphrates via a complicated irrigation system, which then watered the plants on stone balconies to prevent the water from seeping through the terraces. And speaking of Alexander the Great, according to Strabo, the Greek historian, Alexander intended to repair the gardens, but he died before that could happen. Still, that means it had fell into pretty bad shape by the 4th century BC. This was followed up by the Roman historian Quintus Curtius Rufus, who stated that the gardens were on top of the citadel, and again, he lists the garden as being built for the queen who missed her home. The last of the classical sources to speak about the gardens was that of Philo of Byzantium, writing in the 4th and 5th century AD. He would praise its engineering and ingenuity of building vast deep areas of deep soil which had tremendous mass so far above the natural grade of surrounding land, as well as the irrigation techniques. Unfortunately, and strangely, there are no existing Babylonian texts 
they mention the garden, and there's no archaeological evidence that actually support that it ever existed, which has left us with three basic theories on the gardens. The first, they were entirely mythical, and all the descriptions found by the Greek and Roman writings represented a romantic imagination of an eastern garden. This largely comes from the fact that there's no documentation in any Babylonian sources, and there are many records of King Nebuchadnezzar's works, yet his long and complete inscriptions never mention a garden. However, the gardens were said to still exist when later writers described them, and some of these writers had even visited Babylon, so it's hard to say for sure. But what really hurts the cause is not one piece of archaeological evidence has been found, although it could be beneath the Euphrates, as the river flowed east of its current position during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II. For the second theory, we have that the gardens did exist in Babylon, but were destroyed around the 1st century AD or in the 2nd century BC, most likely by an earthquake, and we just haven't found the remnants yet. Or, the third theory, the legend refers to a well-documented garden of the Assyrian king, Sennacherib, who built his capital city of Nineveh on the river Tigris, near the modern-day city of Mosul, and archaeological digs there have found traces of a vast system of aqueducts attributed to Sennacherib by an inscription. Its 50 miles of canals, dams, and aqueducts were used to carry water to the palace in Nineveh, where the Archimedes screw that was referred to by various writers was used to raise water to the upper levels of the gardens. One argument going for this, too, was that only one of the ancient historians actually named Nebuchadnezzar as the king who had built the gardens. All of the rest of them named a Syrian king. Secondly, King Sennacherib stated that the garden was a wonder for all peoples. Finally, the descriptions of the garden fit pretty closely to the descriptions of the hanging gardens of Babylon, especially considering it was a year-round oasis in a dusty summer landscape with marvels of water engineering. There were fruit tree orchards, pines, almond trees, date trees, olive, oak, pear, fig, grapes, you name it, and it was here. And judging from the paintings, writings, and characteristics of the area, Babylon would have had all of these as well. Lastly, there's another theory, well, that just isn't widely believed. That is, it was actually nothing more than rooftop gardens spread throughout the city, which gave the impression of one huge garden, which I find hard to believe. Although the name Hans Nelson Langseth sounds like a cool Viking mystery, it's sadly not. It's about a guy who had the longest beard in the world. As the naming of this iceberg relates, some of the entries on here are considered oddities and not mysteries. And that's what this one is. Hans Longseth, aka King Whiskers, was a man from Norway who moved to North Dakota, or Iowa, depending on the source, and holds the world's record for the longest beard at 18 feet and 6 inches. Before he was buried in 1927, his son cut the beard down to 12 inches and kept the rest, which was eventually put on display at the Smithsonian. Although this one is an oddity, there is a small mystery about his death at the age of 82. It is allegedly not a natural one. Legend states that he stepped on his beard and tripped at the top of the stairs, falling down and breaking his neck. Other sources say he died in a house fire which I kind of doubt, since his beard would presumably have burned up, while another source combines the two and says he died by breaking his neck trying to escape a house fire, while others state that he did in fact die of natural causes. Two thousand eleven, a series of packages coming into the United States would capture the attention of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, who would intercept and inspect the packages. They found that every one lacked the correct customs documentation and also had shipping labels that were false and misleading. The contents had been labeled as ceramic and clay tiles, when in reality, the objects included were ancient tablets from an ancient Sumerian city. These tablets dated back between 2100 to 1600 BC and were mostly legal and administrative documents, bulla or bulle for plural, is an inscribed clay, soft metal, wax, etc. that was used in a commercial and legal documentation 
As a form of authentication, these, which were also found, are so small they can fit into the palm of your hand. In total, the haul ended up being 5,500 artifacts. But from where and to who? That's the interesting part. The artifacts were from Iraq, but the packages were marked from Turkey, a country that doesn't have the same importing requirements as Iraq. Likewise, artifacts sent from Israel were also marked from Turkey. And just who were these items shipped to? Some artifact smuggling ring? Some rich collector? Well, no, not exactly. It was sent to Oklahoma City, the home of Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby's president would actually state they were unaware that these were illegally smuggled and that the company should have exercised more caution and carefully questioned what they were buying. However, the Justice Department would claim that there were numerous red flags that should have tipped them off, which is most likely true since internal staff at Hobby Lobby had notified superiors that the items were most likely looted from Iraq, as well as one expert who warned them that the items were from an archaeological site located in Iraq. Not to mention, Hobby Lobby did not even want to personally meet or communicate with the dealer who got them the artifacts, who advised the company to instead wire them the money to seven personal bank accounts connected to five different individuals, which I mean, probably should have been a tip-off. But why did Hobby Lobby, a store which specializes in arts and crafts, spend $1.6 million smuggling these ancient artifacts? It seems the Christian-ran chain of stores had taken quite an interest in artifacts they could pick up and put in the Museum of the Bible, which also was ran by the same family that owned Hobby Lobby. In 2009, the company president, Larry Green, had stated that their mission was to collect as many biblical artifacts and texts as fast as possible, and they did coming up with 40,000 in just a few years, and then putting them in the Museum of the Bible in DC. After being busted in 2011, they would eventually be forced in 2017 to give up 3,800 items seized from Iraq and then had to pay a fine of $3 million. And then in 2020, they would be forced to return more, almost 12,000 items to Egypt and Iraq. One of these, the Gilgamesh Dream Tablet, which contained part of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and by 2021, Iraq reclaimed 17,000 total looted artifacts held by the Museum of the Bible. I'm not sure on this one what the mystery is, but I think it's just how many items Hobby Lobby illegally smuggled and got away with. Or maybe the mystery is just the whole artifact smuggling thing in general. How many ancient prized possessions have been smuggled and lost? The Holy Grail is a legendary and symbolic object with deep roots in Western mythology, folklore, and religious traditions. It is most commonly associated with King Arthur and Christian mythology. The Holy Grail is typically described as a sacred vessel, cup, or dish that possesses mystical and miraculous properties. Its significance varies depending on the specific interpretation, but some key aspects include King Arthur. In that legend, the Holy Grail is often portrayed as a cup or dish used by Jesus during the Last Supper, the meal he shared with his disciples the night before his crucifixion. According to the story, Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, used the Grail to collect Christ's blood at the crucifixion. The Grail later becomes the object of King Arthur's quest by the Knights of the Round Table, whereas in Christian interpretation, the Holy Grail is deeply intertwined with Christian mythology and the story of the Last Supper. In Christian tradition, it is considered a symbol of the Eucharist, where the wine in the chalice is believed to become the blood of Christ during the Mass. Therefore, the Holy Grail represents the vessel used by Jesus to institute the sacrament. The Grail is often believed to possess miraculous qualities, such as the power to heal or provide sustenance. It is seen as a symbol of divine presence and grace. But the biggest mystery with this one is, what was it? Was it a physical object? such as a cup or dish, like depicted in the King Arthur legend? Or is it a symbol of spiritual enlightenment and divine grace seen in the Christian interpretation? Secondly, what is the origin of the Holy Grail legend? It became widely known, mainly because of the tale of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. This has led many to speculate that the Grail legend may have been inspired by earlier Celtic or pagan myths, or from lost ancient relics or artifacts.
sticking with the religious theme, indulgences are a concept in Catholic theology and practice related to the forgiveness of sins. They have played a significant role in the history of the Catholic Church. The idea of indulgences is rooted in the belief that God's mercy and the authority of the Church to grant spiritual benefits. An indulgence is a remission or forgiveness of the temporal punishment due for sins that have already been forgiven in the sacrament of penance. In other words, it's a way to lessen the consequences of sin in the afterlife. In Catholic theology, sin has both eternal and temporal consequences. Eternal consequences refer to the separation from God, while temporal consequences relate to the suffering or purification that may be required before entering heaven. Indulgences are primarily concerned with the latter. The practice of granting indulgences goes back to the days of the early church, but it became more structured and systematic during the medieval period. Pope Urban II is often credited with the first formal declaration of indulgences during the First Crusade in the late 11th century. There are two main types of indulgences, partial indulgences, which remit part of the temporal punishment due to sin, and plenary indulgences. These remit all of the temporal punishment due to sin. To obtain a plenary indulgence, certain conditions, such as confession, communion, and prayer for the Pope's intentions, must be met. Traditionally, indulgences were granted for various acts of piety, such as visiting holy places, reciting prayers, or performing charitable deeds. In more recent times, the granting of indulgences have become more focused on acts of devotion and spiritual exercises. The sale of indulgences in the late Middle Ages, particularly during the time of the Protestant Reformation, became a source of significant controversy. The sale of indulgences were heavily criticized by reformers like Martin Luther, who saw it as a form of spiritual abuse and a way for the church to raise money. The Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965 brought about significant changes in the Catholic Church, including a reevaluation of the practice of indulgences. The Council emphasized a need for more balanced understanding of indulgences and an encouraged focus on the spiritual benefits rather than a mechanical approach. Today the concept of indulgences still exists in Catholic theology, but it has evolved and is understood in a more spiritual and symbolic manner. The granting of indulgences is less common and has been redefined with the context of the Church's teachings of God's mercy and the reconciliation of the faithful. I'm not sure, but I think this one might just be an oddity and not a mystery, but maybe the mystery is just how confusing it is. On October 7th, 1949, 26-year-old Jean Spangler of Los Angeles, California would leave her home around 5 p.m. The young actress was originally from Seattle and had appeared in bit parts of several movies in the late 1940s and would soon be on her way to becoming a household name, but not because of a movie role. When Jean left her home that day, she would leave her daughter with her sister-in-law, Sophie, and says she planned to meet her ex-husband to discuss a late child support payment, and then was going to work at a night shoot for a movie. Two hours later, Jean would call home and spoke with Sophie as well as speaking to her daughter. She would end up telling Sophie she had to work the full eight hours and probably would not be home that evening. But Jean never arrived home, and since Jean's mother was out of town visiting family, Sophie would go to the police to follow a missing persons report. She would tell detectives that Jean had planned on going to work at a film set after she met with her ex-husband Dexter Benner. However, when detectives checked with the studios, there was no record that Jean ever showed up. Investigators would start searching around to try and find any witnesses that may have seen Jean, and they finally found one a woman at a farmer's market just a few blocks from Jean's home. She had recalled seeing her browsing around at 6 p.m. and said it appeared that she was waiting for someone. Depending on the source, this is the last official sighting of Jean, but there are other sources that state she was seen at a club at 2.30 a.m. where she appeared to be arguing with two men. It didn't take police long to figure out that her ex was most likely responsible. I mean, just after a little bit of digging into their background, they quickly found out that the two had a long, bitter custody battle over their daughter before Jean was finally awarded custody in 1948. But when police went to question Dexter, he would tell detectives he hadn't seen his wife in weeks, and his new wife, whom he had been married to for just a month, confirmed this 
and gave an alibi for that evening, which would seem maybe kind of hard to believe, but detectives would actually take the investigation into a different direction, so they must have believed he wasn't involved, which is really odd, because after Dexter got custody of their daughter, he would get into another custody battle with Jean's mother over not allowing her to have visitation with her granddaughter. Eventually, he fled to Florida, where he spent the rest of his life. So for someone that sure seems suspicious, it's odd he was never seriously pursued. But maybe that's because, two days later, Jean Spangler's purse was found near the entrance of Griffith Park, about six miles from her home. Both of the straps on one side of the purse were torn loose like it had been ripped from her arm. 60 police officers and over 100 volunteers searched the 4,000 plus acres of the park, but found nothing else. Since Sophie told police that Jean had left the home with no money, robbery was ruled out. Suspiciously, there was a note in her purse addressed to a guy named Kirk, which read, Kirk, can't wait any longer. Going to see Dr. Scott. It will be best this way while mother is away. And weirdly, that sentence ended in a comma, which led investigators to think she was abducted while writing it. This Kirk, though, was never located. Nor was Dr. Scott. None of Jean's family or friends knew anyone by those names. However, when Jean's mother finally returned to L.A. and was interviewed by the police, she would tell investigators that a Kirk had picked her up twice at their house but stayed in the car so she never seen who it was. She also stated she had worked together on a set with a man named Kirk, but she didn't remember for which studio. Detectives, meanwhile, would question every doctor with the last name Scott in Los Angeles but none of them had a patient named Jean Spangler or Jean Benner, her married name. Detectives would then find out she had once been involved with an abusive man named Scotty, but her lawyer would tell police she hadn't seen him in four years. The park would be searched again the following week, and this time, a volunteer's dog dug up a L.A. County jail uniform which had been buried in a shallow hole, but nothing else. And here's where we get to the theories. And the first one is a doozy. Around the time Jean disappeared, she had just finished a small part in the movie Young Man with a Horn, starring Kirk Douglas, which led to a ton of speculation that the Kirk mentioned in the note was the famous actor. Douglas, after hearing the news, would call police voluntarily and told them flat out he did not know her. He'd done this while he was on vacation, too, and before police even made the connection, which was certainly odd. But when the head detective called him back to learn more, Douglas admitted they had talked and joked around on the set, but he had never seen her outside the studio. Then, he would go back and clarify all this in a press statement by saying that he had told the detective he didn't remember Jean until a friend reminded him, which I guess is possible. The plot would then thicken when Jean's girlfriends would tell investigators that she was three months pregnant and was about to have an abortion, which was illegal at that time. Witnesses who went to the same clubs and bars as Jean would tell police that they had heard of a medical student known as Doc performed abortions for cash. They tried to find this man, but were never able to, if he even existed. Meanwhile, another actor, Robert Cummings, would tell police that Jean had confided in him that she was having a casual affair, but did not mention the man's name. And to complicate matters, the media was now speculating that Jean may be one of the victims of the active serial killers in LA at the time, potentially even linked to the infamous Black Dahlia murder, whose victim, Elizabeth Short, bore a striking resemblance to Jean, as well as both women having movie aspirations. It wasn't just the press, though. The police were attempting to tie the two cases, but were unsuccessful. Detectives would also run down a theory that it was related to gangsters that she had been affiliated with, apparently from her time as a dancer at a nightclub. Detectives investigated these claims, too, but once again, came up empty-handed but a year after her disappearance, one customs agent in El Paso would report seeing Jean at a hotel with one of these gangsters, that of Davy Ogle. When police went to that hotel, the clerk identified Jean from a photograph, but their names were not on the register. Speaking of Davy Ogle, he vanished two days after Jean. It was never seen again either. Of course, he was under indictment for conspiracy at the time, so it might not be related. And the FBI informant later on, told law enforcement that Ogle had been murdered by a crime group for talking to police. However, it should be noted that Jean's sister would testify that neither her nor Jean were acquainted with Ogle. With that being said, there were a few sightings over the next two years of Ogle and Jean, 
in Southern California, Phoenix, and Mexico City. All these led to nothing too. The case would eventually go cold, and for the opposite reason most cases go cold. This one had too many clues pointing in different directions. It was really hard to determine just who could have done something to her with so many potential suspects. Was it the famous actor, Kirk Douglas? Or did a botched abortion by Dr. Scott cause it? What about her ex-husband? Or did she run off with a gangster? Or could it have been the same man that was responsible for the Black Dahlia murder? Jimmy Hoffa was a prominent American labor union leader and a central figure in the American labor movement during the mid-20th century. He got fame through his involvement in labor unions, where he began at an early age when he worked as a labor organizer for the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, a prominent and influential labor union. He quickly rose through the ranks of the Teamster Union, becoming its national vice president in 1952 and its general president in 1957. Under his leadership, the Teamsters became one of the largest and most powerful unions in the United States. He was known for his fierce dedication to workers' rights and the improvement of labor conditions. He played a pivotal role in organizing truck drivers, warehouse workers, and other laborers. Hoffa's leadership of the Teamsters was marked by controversy and legal troubles, though. He was convicted of jury tampering, attempted bribery, fraud, and other offenses. In 1967, he was sentenced to prison, but was released in 1971 after Richard Nixon commuted his sentence, which leads to the mystery. On July 30th, 1975, Jimmy Hoffa was last seen outside a restaurant in Bloomfield Township, Michigan. He was scheduled to meet with two reputed members of organized crime, Anthony Giacalone and Anthony Provisano. After the meeting, Hoffa vanished without a trace. His disappearance remains one of the biggest mysteries in American history, despite the fact that, well, it looks very obvious to me what most likely happened. He was most likely killed by the Mafia, and his remains were hidden somewhere and never found. However, there are other theories out there. One is that the FBI was responsible for his disappearance. Another one was he joined the Witness Protection Program. The Kennedy Family Curse is a term used to describe a series of tragic and untimely deaths, accidents, and misfortunes that have affected members of the Kennedy family, one of the most prominent and politically influential families in American history. While the majority of people don't believe in curses, the Kennedy family has indeed experienced a disproportionately high number of tragic events and premature deaths. Having two assassinations in one family alone seems a bit rare, but yet that's what happened to both John and Robert Kennedy, the most prominent tragedies in the Kennedy family, with JFK's coming in Dallas, Texas in 1963, and then his brother, RFK, just five years later in LA. But that wasn't even the start. The true beginning of this was in 1941 when Rosemary Kennedy, the eldest daughter, was thought to have suffered from lack of oxygen at birth. Her family sent her to an intellectually disabled school, but by her early 20s, she began to have violent mood swings, and her mental illness was harder to hide. Her father, Joseph, decided to subject her to an experimental new procedure called a lobotomy, not even telling the family till afterwards. The lobotomy was botched and left Rosemary with the intellectual capabilities of a two-year-old, and also took away her ability to walk and talk she had to be cared for in private institutions for the rest of her life, and she was hid away to keep from damaging any political ambitions of the rest of the family. Then we go to 1948. Kathleen Kennedy would die in a plane crash from Paris towards the Riviera when it was caught in a storm. 1963, Jacqueline Kennedy gave birth to a premature baby who died shortly afterwards. Then we go to the plane crashes. Several members of the Kennedy family have died in plane crashes, including Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., the oldest brother, who was killed during World War II, John F. Kennedy Jr., who died in a plane crash in 1999, along with his wife and sister-in-law. Other members of the family, such as Senator Ted Kennedy, the youngest brother, survived an accident in 1969, but killed passenger Mary Jo Kopechny. In fact, by the time Ted Kennedy had suffered the car crash of 1969, he had lost four siblings prematurely, and in 1978, Ted Kennedy Jr. would have to have his leg amputated due to swift spreading cancer. 1984, Robert Kennedy's son, David, died from an overdose, while his son, Michael, died in a skiing accident at the age of 39, which brings us back to the curse. Is it real or not? The idea of a curse associated with the Kennedy family 
has more to do with the family's high public profile and political prominence, causing it to receive more attention and scrutiny. And although the majority of families will not have assassinations, most families will see their fair share of tragic accidents as well as health and addiction issues. However, if there was a curse, who was responsible? The family had no shortage of enemies, but one theory is that the person responsible for the curse is none other than their father, Joe Kennedy, who brought it on himself by the forceful way he pushed his kids to go for political offices or other prestigious lines of work instead of letting them pursue their own interest, and more importantly, for how he had his daughter Rosemary lobotomized for the fear of shame over her mental issues. King Midas is a figure from Greek mythology, best known for the story of his Midas Touch. He was the ruler of Phrygia, an ancient kingdom in what is now modern-day Turkey. He is often portrayed as a wealthy and powerful king. He is most famous for his wish that everything he touched would be turned to gold. This wish was granted to him by the god Dionysus as a reward for his hospitality to a drunken Silenus, a companion of Dionysus. While initially excited by his newfound power, Midas soon realized that it was a curse, as it turned everything, including food and loved ones, into unfilling gold. The story of King Midas is meant as a moral tale, which warns against greed and materialism. And while he is a figure from Greek mythology, some historians and archaeologists believe that there may have been a real King Midas. Although the stories about his golden touch and other mythological aspects are, of course, legendary in nature. Which brings us to the first part of this mystery. Did he really exist? The historical evidence for this may have been the real historical king of Phrygia in the 8th century BC. His name was Midas, and he died by suicide after the capital was sacked by Sumerians. This Midas is also believed to be the same individual called Meda in the Assyrian text. So where does the story of the Golden Touch come from then? Well, for one, the capital city of Phrygia was called Gordian, and this area where King Midas lived, well, it didn't have an abundance of gold. In fact, at archaeological sites, the only gold found was from a few pieces of jewelry and ornaments, but even that's been rare. Even in the royal tombs and monuments, there's not been any gold recovered. But there's still a theory for the origin of the Midas touch. Turns out, the answer lies in a tomb of someone from the nobility, most likely Midas' father, who was covered with a textile that contained a pigment called gothite, which gave the material a golden shine. This same material was found in other textiles in the area. It seems that maybe the royal family had been wearing such golden looking garments and it became a hallmark of the elite. There's also another theory that this legend came about just because Midas was so rich. Due to the electrum found in the river Pactolus, which they then used for the basis of their economy, that river also appears golden in color due to the electrum that was found there. The legend states that King Midas stopped to bathe and it turned the water to gold. Regardless, either of these theories means that the story of King Midas is based on some truth. And that brings us to the end of this new series, Historical Mysteries and Oddities. If y'all liked it, let me know in the comment section below and we will come back to it at some point and do a part two. Goodbye and good night.